You are listening to the Level Up Gaming Podcast, episode 170, Streamlining Games. In today's episode, we discuss streamlining games. We look over multiple games and discuss what they do to streamline play. We also talk about what you can apply to streamline your current game. We continue the cross promo we have with various podcasts. This month, we have Roll Gay Roleplay. Stay tuned for a word from them later in the episode. If you'd like to participate in the discussion or leave us feedback, you can contact us at levelupyourgamingpodcast at gmail.com or find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash levelupyourgaming. If you like the content and want to hear more of the show, subscribe and we'll ensure you don't miss an episode. New episodes come out almost every Wednesday. Also, please review, tell a friend about the podcast, or share with your gaming group. Now sit back and enjoy the episode. Welcome to the Level Up Your Gaming Podcast. My name is Aaron, and joining me virtually, I've got Josh. Josh, how you doing today? No. I just no. cut you off when we started this recording. Just, I'm, I'm trying to talk. I'm trying to, like, have a conversation here, and you're all like, no, let's make a podcast. No, I'm doing great. How you doing, Aaron? Some podcasts are a medium of words in which we discuss things, okay? Yeah, I understand that we should probably... You know, spend some time actually discussing things in a recorded method rather than just rehashing the same things we just talked about after you press the record button. But, you know, that's. Listen, let's let's just cut to the chase. Let's just streamline the process. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we should try new things. We should, uh, you know, maybe make things work a little bit better um, and take our cues from the time that we've got. Yes, yes. And uh, I, I think that as the uh, the gaming genre evolves, if you go back to our history of the uh, the gaming, uh, as it sort of evolved, I think a lot of games have decided to, to cut out the fat in terms of uh, the rules and stuff and have started to streamline uh, more and more in terms of what role-playing is. Yeah. Yeah. Um... And so I was looking through a list. Uh, I was getting, you know, different games that have come out either this year or planning to come out. Uh, they were supposed to have come out this year, probably coming out early next year. And what I noticed was a couple of things. And we'll get into it as we go, but cards are a big part uh, for telling stories. And another big thing is it looks like there's a lot of systems that are going and offering solo play. Now, um, they had a a thing on Humble Bundle, not sponsored. Um, I love Humble Bundle. And so I pick up stuff whenever I can on there. And I sent you a, a link to that that had a whole ton of solo game options where you can just sit down and, you know, run your own game and go through it. But there's a couple of these that are in here that are just that. They are ways to have a game just by yourself because it relies more on the story than it does on, you know, uh, the mechanics. Oh, that's interesting. And I think, yeah. And I, I think there's, there's something I learned from each one of these games that I got listed here. So, yeah. I mean, again, so, I mean, what the, again, the more modern RPGs, like I said, have, have streamlined more stuff. We've talked about it in general in a lot of things, which is uh, trying to get away from as many roles, trying to make it more story focused. Um, you know, some games have done away with roles altogether, which I'm sure you're going to see as we kind of go through it, uh, through this, or they use different uh, forms to generate your, uh, you know, your your luck or your your randomness within a game. Um, and you, it, it, it sort of you want to just get past the. Um, okay, well, are there any traps? Okay, roll for the traps. Are there any of these things? Gonna roll for that. Roll for this. Roll for that. Roll for this. You know, you don't want to roll fast. You want to have something that's a little bit more uh, dynamic, you know, shall we say. Mm -hmm. Maybe a little bit more in tune and in line with what the character sheet says the skills are. And so, you know, you want to give an amount to your players or you want to give your lot to your players because the players in general should know or the ones that know should know. Yeah. So uh, I just want to go through a couple of these games um, that I found. And I think that, you know, just a little bit of blurb about them. Um, now, I've played like 
a handful of these. Uh, I've read a bunch more, but some of them, a lot of them aren't even out. Uh, and you just get to read, you know, what they're, they're on their Kickstarter or their itch.io page, you know, about the game. And you get a feel for it. And understanding where games are going um, can really help you, you know, understand what can I do to my games? What can I do to my worlds, my stories, to make them more streamlined, to make them more, I don't know, up to date? Just because you're playing D&D Second Ed doesn't mean it has to be a D&D Second Ed story. You can, you know, streamline it a bit. Um, so one of the first ones that I saw in here, and I've seen this all over the place, was Gloomhaven. Aaron, have you ever played Gloomhaven? I have not played Gloomhaven. Funny story, though, I went to get a, uh, a box, uh, a, a basically a, like a gigantic, like, token organizer for my uh, game Spirit Island, and the company on accident sent me the one for Gloomhaven which was much wow. larger. And I'm like, this doesn't make any sense. <laughs> yeah. I, well, Gloomhaven, the box set, like I saw it at a store once and uh, was like, geez, that thing looks huge. And they're like, yeah. And it's also very expensive. And uh, then I never saw the box set again. And apparently it was like really hard to find the box set. You had to like order it or whatever. So um, I thought it was going to be, you know, really interesting, you know, get to play it. And it is, it's a, there's a, like a box set. It's a, uh, harkens back to like the, the hero game that we used to play. Um, it is just, you know, it's boards. It's a board game with characters and cards for the actions. And, uh, it's, you can just sort of like explore dungeons and do fun stuff and very, interesting in that it was just a board game that they're now turning into a full-on RPG. And in that way, they're trying to make it cross-compatible so that, you know, your characters from your board game can play in this RPG and vice versa. Same mechanics, same setup. Um, and I think that's, that's you know, they, they figured out a decent system that people liked and sort of expanded it so that, well, we don't need the boards. You know, mm -hmm. we can just play the game. And I think that's really interesting. Uh, once again, as we've talked about, they use cards for different actions. You know, it's it's not, um, you know, successes and fails are a part of those cards. It's not uh, left up to, oh, I don't know, that was a 13, but, you know, you could have been this, or... Uh, it's not, it's a very straightforward yes or no that this happened or this is how well it happened because it's written right out there. It's just going to be a quicker experience. There's not going to be any question about how it happened. You get to do what you do and mm -hmm. that's just how it is. Yeah. No, I mean, again, that's, I mean, what more can I say about that? It's just it's a it's an interesting system there. It's interesting that they're trying to to merge the concept of bringing in your characters from the board game and bring them into, uh, you know, the actual role playing game itself. So you can sort of go back and forth, kind of context switch there. Well, I mean, I, we've done that in Heroes Quest before, where you you create a character you like, and you were playing through the board game. You're like, okay, well, let's turn it into a D and D character. Um, yeah, but that's a little bit more involved. You got to think about like the actual back and forth of that. Because if you wanted to go back to Heroes Quest, no. how do you detranslate? No, you don't. You just <laughs> tune Heroes Quest up to being D and D on a board. Yeah, because it was always D and D light. It was designed to be. So, I it, it, I, I find it very interesting that they were able to make at least a complex enough board game. Turning it into RPG will still work. So I like it. Um, the next one I came across, I mean, I came across a bunch of things, but like uh, this one was Tales of Primordia. Um, Tales of Primordia is by the same people did the My Little Pony game, uh, Tales of... Oh, God, what is the My Little Pony universe called? I don't know. Oh, I should know this. Um, anyway, whatever it is. Uh, 
adorable cartoon dinosaurs. That's what it is. It's adorable cartoon dinosaurs. It's a fairly simple system, uh, not overly complicated, not a lot of different skills and rules and blah, 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 because it's designed with like families in mind, like kids, young players, um, teens. You know, it's supposed to be just like a fun, enjoyable adventuring system. And really, I, I like the concept of being able to play games with my family. Yeah. Um, no, I think that that's, a, I mean, you know, as, as my little one grows up at some point in time, I'm going to want to introduce her to the hobby. And, uh, you know, having simple games or games that are less complicated with rule sets that are not as intense as D&D or something that you can bring them into, uh, you know, in, in a younger age, uh, definitely, you know, it makes the cut. And, it, you know, you're trying to, it's also more, I guess, thematically better for a child in, in that kind of way. You know, it's, you know, cartoon dinosaurs, adorable cartoon dinosaurs. You know, you kind of have a, a better niche and a better fit there than, uh, you know, your high fantasy or even like your dark gritty, like low fantasy, however you want to run your game. But I mean, like there's a lot of, the fantasy genre in general is very, uh, is sort of niche in a way. And it's, you know, it, it takes, you know, there, there's a certain type of person who wants to get into it and really enjoy it. So, um, you know, although D and D I would say is king as you go kind of further into, uh, to RPGs or at least in the top of the, of the, the pantheon there, you're, you know, you want to have something to be able to gate people into a game. And that's probably where you're going to end up with a lot of these modern RPGs that are more, you know, rules folks. Cause it's probably closer to like a, uh, pl- like pu- pulling out a board game and playing for a couple of hours than, uh, mm-hmm. than sitting down <laughs> for, for, for a multi-session slog fest that you've got going into your D and D campaign. Yeah. So like, I've got, you know, two teenagers and we're trying to play games and we picked up and it's, it's like a year or two old now. I don't remember when it came out, the fallout board game. Right. Mm -hmm. And it uses cards for a lot of its quests, uh, but it still uses dice for, you know, uh, resolving actions. Mm -hmm. But my God, the rules. It's just rules on top of rules on top of rules. And I think that a simpler system that's not so like, yeah, it Fallout is grim and gritty, but it's also kind of cartoony uh, in its grim and gritty set- setting. Mm-hmm. So that's nice. And it can sort of border that. But like just something fun for the kids would be nice. And then fun for the adults would be the next option. And I mean adults because the people that would really appreciate this are getting on in years. Uh, Monty Python's co-curricular media evil reenactment program. Me. (laughs) Uh, Like everything I've heard about this is that, yes, it is a, a, a comic game for buffoons, but also it's more than just hey, we've got the IP, so let's make a game out of this. They went and really tried to make a toolbox to sort of generate a world that could be very Monty Python-esque. So your players, instead of taking a normal, normal, seriously normal D&D story and turning it into Monty Python, you just start at the Monty Python level and just, you know, stay there. Maybe by the end of it, you'll have some serious players doing serious things, totally ruining your Monty Python game. Yeah, no, I mean, if you're going to play a Monty Python game, you're going to be playing, uh, doing silly things, because that's what Monty Python is. (laughs) Yeah, well, and I think, you know, if we talk about streamlining game playing, just starting out and the silly start, you know, that's what you're going to do. Just be there. Yeah, I mean, again, I don't know anything about the rules for the game itself, but, um, you know, silly games tend to be, uh, especially if you listen to our last Let's Make a One-Shot, silly games uh, definitely 
tend to favor, you know, very rules light. So they are very fast. It's sort of like anything goes. As long as it's not totally like world breaking and world shattering. Like you can't be like, I destroy the world. No, anything else goes pretty much. <laughs> you know, tell me what, what silly thing you want your character to do or what outlandish thing you want your character to do, and we're gonna make it happen. Yes. And I think that it's just it's a nice palate cleanser also. Everybody needs to have a laugh. Everybody needs to just like relax once in a while. Um, I know I was stressed out from work and then we went and did the, the let's make a one shot and I felt better even just talking about the jokes. So I think that something like that is probably a good idea to have too. Uh, the next entry, however, I have played, uh, I've got the, um, the play test. So I guess I haven't played the, the official version. I've just played the play test of it. Uh, the Marvel's multiverse role-playing game. Okay. If you want to talk about too many rules, like this is at the top of it. Um, the book isn't very thick. The playtest book isn't super thick, but it is nonstop. Like here are just tables and tables and tables and tables of things you can do. You have written it's down the D616. Like, custom building your own heroes and how will they interact with other things. Um, you know, I remember like a good over 20 years ago uh, playing D20 systems where you can go and create uh, uh, masters and mind something. What was that game? Aaron, do you remember that game? The uh, Mutants and Masterminds? Own... Mutants and Masterminds. There you go. Uh, you make your own superheroes and it very much feels like the same thing. It's very much the Let's take all the stuff that Marvel has done over the past, I don't know, several decades and condense it into a bunch of tables. Uh, and I think, you know, too much is too much. So maybe we're learning that even though this is a modern game, it's not that streamlined? <laughs> no, it's definitely not. But, like, you can learn that just reading through it, it doesn't look like it's a thick book, but it is too much. It could be slimmed down. It could be reduced to some simple things, but it is very much a, uh, like a lot. There's a lot going on. And yeah, if you want to make a very complicated hero and like, you know, see how they'll fare up against other heroes and get involved in hero stuff, fine. But there's better ways to do it that aren't going to be nearly this complex. And it looks like trying to, uh, to, to GM a game like this is just going to, it's going to be a, a, a fight of rules, lawyery things. And that doesn't sound like fun at all. So yeah, keep your, keep your, your rules simple. R remove unnecessary things. Don't make your games more complicated than they need to be because everybody's going to have a bad time. Uh, speaking of a bad time, Warhammer 40k has got a new game. I know they had a uh, a game uh, that came up before that was more about you know playing the the Warhammer uh, the main characters you know, but this one uh, Imperium Maledictum is actually about playing normal people in the Warhammer universe, and I think that's fun. That's interesting. Because it's the same 40k world, but you get a different view of things. I've never played the 40k world. Why did you say this one was uh, one that you uh, were kind of rolling your eyes on? Or maybe I misunderstood you there. I'm not rolling my eyes on. I think this is. I think it's very interesting about. Um, you know, it, it is uh, grim, dark. It is you know everything's out to get you. Uh, the world is is like very much if you are a normal citizen you're screwed and so uh playing you know as those normal citizens trying to survive in that world it's like um playing a a merchant game in somebody else's D, D hero campaign you know you're just trying to make your living and they're blowing up cities so 
that's that sounds like a fun game to me. <laughs> it's, you could do some fun stuff with that. I think I would probably uh, there's probably a bunch of like your know, true Warhammer 40k enthusiasts that would uh, probably poo poo the ideas that I would have for that type of game, but um, or would go that's not possible. Like the the, the purest in you would would poo poo anything I do. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, that's kind of the fun part of it. Um, so then, you know, going further, uh, there's a couple of games, and I want to move some of the stuff around, um, that are a little bit more lighthearted. Um, I came across one called uh, Koriko's Magic Year, or Magical Year. Uh, this is what we were talking about before with solo games. This is a solo journaling game in that you are supposed to write a journal about what happens. Uh, the whole story is that you are a witch who is going to a town that you've never been to before, and you're going to be the resident witch for a year. That's it. That's the whole game. Uh, the gameplay works because you've got tarot cards and there's events and based on the tarot cards you pick up you different events happen and you have to interpret them and it's all about learning to tell a story so it's less it's it's an rpg in the sense that you know you're playing the role of this character and you are sort of narrating what happens um but there's no winning or losing. It's just you getting to learn how to tell a story. It's very and, interesting in that you could use that as a gateway into becoming a GM. So Very much so. But also, it's very much in the sense of um, if you are a GM and you're not very good with yes-anding, you're given prompts and told to figure it out and you're supposed to write a whole year's worth of journal in this you have one year to journal out what happened now i don't think it's like every day or like you know multiple things per day but like it's it's a game where you get to tell a story and you don't know what the story is until it happens so it's sort of like tarot cards are sort of like your mad libs to help you get yeah <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's really interesting. Um, and it is like a solo game, but it is also, uh, you know, it's got an interesting world, an interesting setup, and the way it's designed to sort of draw you out into making something, learning how to do things, uh, is very interesting. And you could easily take some of those concepts about, you know, where's the story going, what's happening, and bring those into sort of your downtime sessions between games. Like, what's happening? Uh, this, these, these are what the cards are. What do you say they, you know, make your players interpret what's happening and get them to sort of open up and act as their characters. Lean into it, but yes, and it. Could be fun. Yeah. Uh, another one that I saw that was also very, you know, it's a card game. Uh, or no, it's not a card game. It's just, it's an experimental role-playing game about, you know, being a character. Uh, it's it's Yezba's, uh, Yezeba's, Yezeba's Bed and Breakfast. Okay. Yezeba's Bed and Breakfast. Your players don't create characters. They're given pre-gen characters from the book. And these pre-gen characters aren't just like, here's your stats. They're, here's your personality. And here's how they interact with other people. Go. And then they're given situations that they have to deal with, but they have to they have to sort of step into these characters. Interesting. So it's a very social, socially geared game, it sounds like. Yeah. It's, it's, um, it's probably the one that I most associated with uh, improv mm -hmm. it would be you know you're given a character and a scene and you're supposed to interact with the other characters in, in that scene in the way that that character would interact 
But instead of it being, you know, played to laughs, it may be played to whatever. It could just be, you know, so this is a bed and breakfast. You've got people that are living there and this is what happens. This is how they interact. Yeah. It definitely sounds interesting. I would definitely have, you know, fun with it. Um, and let's see, there's, I want to skip down to the bottom of my list here. Uh, there's two more that are similar. Uh, there's four small creatures such as we, which is a Carl Sagan quote. Um, it is another solo journaling game. Still uses cards for events. Uh, but it could be a cooperative card game. Uh, the the storyline for this one is that you are a spacefaring crew doing random jobs, trying to survive. And so your cards are the events that you get to do. And you sort of walk through what's happening and, you know, what things come up, you come up against and how you're going to resolve them is, is sort of up to you and uh, working through that. And then the other one that I wanted was, I wanted to talk about was All the Witches. It's still in Kickstarter, but I'm reading through the documents. It's, it says that it has deck building mechanics. Interesting. But it's a role playing game. So you build your characters in like picking from the different cards and sort of building out things as you go. I'm assuming that, you know, as you, instead of like a leveling system, maybe you just get additional cards uh, for your character to be able to use additional skills, abilities, that sort of thing. And it sounds like you should be able to combine them to make more interesting effects. That makes so, sense. I mean, I mean, the whole purpose of a deck builder, if you've ever played one, is to sort of thin out your deck to the most useful cards and then be able to cycle through your entire hand in a single round. Or entire, your entire deck in a single round, I should say. So, yeah. to, yeah, I mean... To get useful cards that are able to deal with the situations that you're, you're encountering. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of deck building games, you know, the, the Marvel deck building games or some of the other games that we've played here... Um, are very much yes you everything does damage you want the stuff that does the most damage that's the quickest that can you know keep you alive and, and get you through to the next encounter but if you're doing a role-playing session maybe you want to have options you know you probably want to have a mix of things be, to be able to handle the various situations because i'm guessing that i mean again i know nothing about this game but my guess is that in lieu of dice in you might have multiple decks too. There might be a combat deck and there might be a social deck, something like that. But, you know, in lieu of dice, you're probably going to be drawing five cards for your turn and you can get, play the cards. You can cycle through other ones, kind of a la Slay of the Spire vibes. You know anything yeah. about that game? So, mm -hmm. well, and it also, um, I just had it and it just went away. I just had a thought in my head. It's gone. Um, we take a break now to hear a word from Roll Gay Roleplay. The new season of Roll Gay Roleplay uncovers the mysteries of Soul Quest City. This comedy fiction story follows four detectives Bay, let's go kill somebody, Lynn Spector St. Tit, obviously, I am a man of sophisticated cigarette taste, Rux Baldacino. Hey, did you say at thug? Make sure they're, like, regular hot dogs, no ketchup. And Zastasha Felzar. Hashtag live, laugh, love. Hashtag tentacle. Hashtag bailing you out. As they search for clues and unlock secrets one client at a time. Season 5 of Roll Gay Roleplay is available now on your preferred podcast platform. We now return to the conversation on Level Up Your Gaming Podcast. We'll come back to it if we get it. <laughs> yeah, that's 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 maybe. Um, there's there's another uh, one a solo RPG that I saw in here, which was One Breath Left, and that's another space exploration, but it's not uh, like a journaling game. 
it's it's qualifying itself as an RPG, but it it just sounds like a solo card game. And I've seen them at the stores. Like, um, have you seen the Final Girls uh, card games? No, no. Um, it, you get to it's a base pack, and then you get to pick the different movie genre or whatever, and you get to play as a Final Girl. Um, One Breath Left is supposed to be a like an a spaceship exploration deck game. And the whole point is that uh, you got to keep track of your O2 and your cards are the different events that you're going to be running across. And you're going to have to, you know, have enough cards to survive uh, cards left at the end to survive and that you've got enough O2 and that's how you, you win your game. And so it, you, you sort of get to yes. And your way through the story. And once again, th- there's different things you got to keep track of. I could see this, you know, any of these card games, they're about uh, providing randomization to the events that are happening and letting the player sort of interpret how things are going to happen. They're not, you know, you're going to fail, you're going to lose if you don't do this or you don't do that or you don't roll this number by this point. They're a, things are happening. You didn't expect this to happen. This is going to be different. This is going to be strange. Um, And you've got to like really pull out a story, a a way it's going to happen. And I think that works really well in a lot of these games, in a lot of games that, you know, I've told um, you present your players with something, something they didn't expect. How are they going to get out of it? What are they going to do? And it can help your players sort of move forward in terms of making decisions when encountering things. But it's also good for you because you get to sort of, uh, how does the story happen when you're given random stuff? I mean, it's uh, what's interesting about it is it, basically it's just, it's your, in lieu of having a storyteller, your event cards are your storyteller. So it, 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 they're trying to, to give you the random encounters, which is what it is. And, uh, you know, I, a listener of ours a long time ago or a while ago, uh, Gary, I don't know if you still listen to the podcast, haven't had any feedback from you in a little bit, but um, he brought up in an email to us uh, that he used a deck for doing random encounters in his game. And I thought that that was, uh, you know, an interesting way to do randomness, but you have the sort of like this fortune deck that sort of rolls through. So every time somebody encounters something, you you turn it and then you burn it, and then you can kind of see what, what the players encounter. So um, it's, it's your special custom set of random encounters. Some of them were good. Some of them were, uh, you know, bad. And, you know, I'm sure there were probably more bad to good in terms of the ratio because you want your players to encounter conflict instead of always reaping the rewards of things uh in terms of randomness but it does give you uh direction to go with when your players are sort of muddling through something when you're doing something that seems very monotonous um and that's how you kind of get a a solo game moving is that you're going to be able to do that and then you kind of write your own story as you kind of move through it so that that's those are very interesting how that uh, that kind of plays out yeah. Um, stepping away from card games for a second, uh, I'd like to draw our attention to a game I came across that I'm really actually interested in and love the concept called Coffee and Chaos. Uh, Coffee and Chaos is designed to be a drop-in. It's it's designed to be like a one-shot drop-in. So you've got an existing campaign and you take your characters from your campaign, regardless of what they are, regardless of the system, and you make those characters work at a coffee shop where something horrible goes wrong. <laughs> you admit, I, I, I read coffee shot goes bad, and I was oh, like, what does that yep. mean? <laughs> I mean, it's a shot of coffee. Aaron, if you've never Co- been to coffee shop, goes bad. Got it. Oh, yes. Okay, yeah, context it's... matters. Um... 
<laughs> it's a one shot at the shop. It's, it's I'm just combining things. I'm streamlining my sentences. <laughs> no, a, it's this. It's it's a really interesting thing that like you have a game, and it the entire the entire rule set, the entire game setup fits on a menu. It's like a trifold menu, the same sort of you'd have at like a cafe or you know a, a diner or something like that. And um, there's two parts that I like about it is that it's it can be a drop in one shot. You know, so you could just have your players do a thing like in between stories. You're going to run at a coffee shop for a minute. You're, you're laying low from the authorities. So you're working at a coffee shop, whatever it is. And uh, the second part I like about it is that because it is supposed to be system agnostic for the players coming in, they are given a new system to deal with uh, problems, issues, things that come up. It's knives, forks, and spoons. Knives are direct approaches, forks are creative approaches, and spoons are considered approaches. They're all dealing with a problem. They're all approaching and resolving an issue, but they are different ways that an issue can be resolved. And getting your players to think, do I want a direct, a creative, or considered approach? Do I want knives, forks, or spoons? I think is an excellent idea. It's just like a great way to get your players in the habit of there's a problem in front of me. I have options. Which ones do I want? What do I think is the best option rather than, oh no, there's a problem in front of me. What am I supposed to do? No, you've got, you've got concepts and then you can work towards them. No, that's very interesting. I, I, I think this would be a really fun game to, to throw in, especially like you're in the middle of a D and D adventure, you know, sort of between level 14 and 15. And then you just kind of, interlude that you guys are like working at a coffee shop <laughs> heroes of the kingdom just took out the entire conclave of the damned sealed the gates of hell and you know whatever and but now we've got to work at the coffee shop for a summer you got your barbarian breaking the mugs and... <laughs> yeah the wizard can't figure out the espresso machine. It's just like, oh, damn you. Where's the manual? <laughs> I think it's great. I think it's an excellent idea. It's fun to have, like, humorous one-shots. We've already talked about that. But more so, um, you know, just dropping dumb stories in that, you know, and then put your players in that spot. It doesn't have to be coffee shop. It could be, you know, you could have just a different sort of game that your players have to do, like in between sessions, in between stories, they can go and do that sort of thing. And then the knives, forks, and spoons just love that. Love that as a, a way to get your players to think about how they're going to approach problems. It's very interesting. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to jump up here to Relic. Okay. Uh, I don't have much to say about Relic. Uh, it's the concept is that, you know, you are suffering the effects of the generations before you, like your forefathers and the ancestors and what, like they've done some terrible things and now the world is in chaos. And, you know, you get items handed down to you from blah, blah, blah. Don't care about that. Um, I want to play the game. I want to, you know, see how it actually plays, how it's set up, whatnot. What I liked out of it and what I think should be involved in more games may not be streamlining. Sure. I'll call it streamlining and I'll tell you why is that they fight colossal Titans. They fight giant monsters, massive ones like shadow, the Colossus, like King Kong, right? Mm Mm-hmm. And here's how I'm going to qualify this as streamlining. You could make them fight an army. Nope, just one guy. Cutting that entire army down to one guy. It also sets up a, uh, it streamlines the ability to understand kind of what your your objective is. There's not a, you know, you know when one of these shows up, you're, that's your job, taking care of that thing. 
Yeah, it's the Tarasque. It's Godzilla. You know that's a thing. If you don't deal with it, we're all screwed. Um, but also, it's Godzilla, and you are, you know, a dude. So how are you going to encounter it? You've got to figure out, you know, there's, it is a problem that you need to resolve uh, with a knife, a fork, or a spoon. I don't recommend eating Godzilla. Well, you could try. Um, let's see. What else we got here? Uh, break is another fun one. Um, as far as I can tell, it's just a D20 system. It's just a D20 system. Like It's the same D20 systems that we've played in dozens of other games. Um, the system itself isn't very interesting. The style is nice. It's very uh, JRPG, very uh, like classic Nintendo uh, in terms of artwork. It's uh, the character classes. I think there's two princess classes. One's a battle princess and one's like a, a violent princess or a stabby princess. I don't know. Um, it's... <sighs> What I liked about it, what I saw in it, was it's very much style over substance. Like, just because you're already sitting in a, a genre doesn't mean you can't just have fun with style. You can't just, you know, have a game that's maybe not as deep. But it's fun because it's it's just fun. It's a thing. You know, it's, it's the... Uh, the enjoyment of the thing rather than, you know. You convince me that most it. things can be fun for a, a game or two. Uh, I don't know if you can carry style uh, infinitely over substance. I feel like you know, that's uh, that's when you get past the one-shot territory there. So <laughs> well, and that's what I think. If it's got like a D20 system behind it, mm -hmm. you can have a lot of style. There's substance there. Or at least it'll fit with substance because there's a lot in the background, you know, that we've done before there. But um, style is a great way to bring people into a game. And, you know, those first couple of sessions don't have to be, you know, super heavy with technic te uh, technicalities. Um, they can just be fun games. And then it can build into something more technical. Yeah, definitely. Uh, the last couple of these are more like horror games that I found. Um, there is uh, Old Gods of Appalachia. I've heard of this one because Jared's going to run us a game in it because he listens mm -hmm. to the podcast and he really likes it. So <laughs> It's a podcast about weird stories, you know, cryptids, modern horror, all that fun stuff. Um, and the game is the same. It's, it's you know, spooky woods, uh, cryptids running amok, uh, mountains, the, the, the forest is alive and is out for blood. You know, it sounds fun. It's classic horror, but for people that live in the city and they're afraid of the woods. Uh, another fun horror one that I saw was public access. Uh, public access is basically the same thing. You're doing mysteries, um, but the mysteries that you're trying to solve are like internet creepypasta. Mm -hmm. The public access is, uh, I'm trying to remember the, creepypasts off of it's um there's a city in new mexico that had a public access station and the whole thing vanished like in the 80s just vanished like gone psh, gone mm. and so you're out there trying to find out what happened to it uh very much you know horror weird what i like about this and the old gods of appalachia together in terms of you know because they sort of use the same thing, and the next one does too a little bit, um, is that they're stealing existing stories, and they're just throwing people into them. You're not, you know, 
writing your own mystery and thinking, oh man, I've created the most wonderful thing ever. And then somebody else reads this as, oh, it's like this. And you're like, oh my God, it is. I just created Judge Dredd for nights or, you know, uh, just because you have stolen another piece of work, somebody else's, you know, story, movie, book, comic series, because you've cribbed off those notes, it doesn't mean it can't be fun. You can throw people into existing stories. You should. I, I'm a big fan of stealing existing stories and making them your own. I know we've talked about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, and that's what this is. It's they're, they're, they're uh, you know, looking for creepy stories that exist out there and will make your players live them. You know, it sounds fun. Um, and to that end, just because I was talking creepy stories doesn't mean you can also do the same thing with classical pieces of artwork. Oh, yeah, you're looking at me with a confused look on your face. I am. Hieronymus, Hieronymus Bosch. Uh, he's the guy that wrote, drew those paintings where, like, oh, yeah. there's a okay. billion things happening at once, and, like, the more you look at it, the more weirded out you are. It's basically AI artwork, but from, like, a couple of centuries ago. Is that the guy who did the Garden of Good and Evil? Garden of Earthly Delights. Earthly Delights. In fact, that's the name of the game. Hieronymus, Garden of Earthly Delights. Uh, yeah, Hieronymus Bosch, 1516 is when he died. So, yeah, a couple of centuries ago. Um, the story is that you're escaping and you're being chased by the follower and whatever. I love it. You are traversing maps that are hex crawls of Hieronymus Bosch paintings instead of like a hex crawl through the desert or through the woods or, you know, through space. No, it's a Hieronymus Bosch painting and your, your GM has to like explain what's going on in the various weird squares you're going through on the painting. It's just the paintings with a hex map over it and you just got to figure it out. I love it. It's insane. But it's once again, you don't have to come up with like an intricate, you know, massively in depth story. There's a guy chasing you. You've got to escape. And I don't know. You're wandering through a Hieronymus Bosch painting. So you get to like look at what's happening on the in that particular hex on the the painting be like this is where you are at this is what's happening i think it's great I, again i i can see that being a good a good time so. yeah and as far as you know streamlining once again you don't have to be all serious about creating your games you can have a little bit of fun with it and still make a serious game um the last one i've got on here is probably uh, the one that sort of warms me to the core uh, in terms of concept. It is inevitable, a doomed Arthurian Western RPG. Uh, the concept here is that you have Wild West cowboy knights and they are protecting the city of mist or something. And the uh, prophets have all said it's going to fall. It's going to end. It's going to be taken out. There's a bad thing coming. And so your cowboy knights, your cowboys, they're going to fight it. And they're going to fail. And they know they're going to fail, but they got to like, you got to do what you got to do. So the whole game is you have to play to lose. You're, you're trying to lose the best you can. So your winning condition within this game is 
losing the least amount that you can lose. It's losing in the best possible way. Getting the best out of your, your inevitable death. Got it. Yeah. And I think that's, that's a fun concept because then you are... Um, You're definitely playing fast in this type of game. At least that's the, the, the sense that I would get from it. It's not a cautious game because you know you're going to die eventually. So, mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, but it doesn't have to end with the character's death. You could, you know, uh, because you've got this sort of this rolling cast of people dying, you could just roll in more people. Like, yeah, uh, Dave died, and this is how it ended, and now Steve's coming to take his place. And, you know, you just get this rolling cast that keeps going, and how well you died just pushes you further and further. And uh, I think the fun part about that is that stories can be doomed. You can have you know, uh, the worst possible outcome and still make the best out of it. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> 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 Don't know how I feel about this one. It's, it sounds interesting in like, are you, again, if, if your goal within the game, the, the success of the game is that you are trying to come up with the craziest way that your character is going to lose. But, uh, you know, by doing probably more and more outlandish stuff to get a very cool, epic death. But that being said, you know, the game's premise is that, like, you can't win. So, like, you know, though again, you have to be KYP. That's what I'm just saying about it. So. <laughs> well, yeah, it's, it's definitely one of those, um, if people get, you know, attached to characters or, like, you know, oh, it comes in like I wrote this thirty-page novel for my character's backstory. First of all, don't be that guy. Uh, second of all, you you should probably know the game you're going into before you like get too attached to a character. <laughs> um, you've said before with pre-gens, you know, drive like you drive stole it like it. you stole it. And uh, with this, it's. It's very much that, and I I love the concept of that because you get to sort of explore it without having any uh, attachment to what's happening to this character. And sometimes you get way more attached to the actions of a character that way because you aren't playing, you know, with the training wheels on. You're just going for it. And that can be a lot of fun. Um, do you have anything else to add to this one, Josh? I don't think you do because you covered all the games, but. <laughs> yeah, I got a lot of games that I've been looking at. Um, no. No. Okay. Uh, I, so I, no. <laughs> I just cut you off there like I did at the beginning of this podcast. <laughs> Uh, but if you uh, if you have any thoughts on how to stream live games, if maybe something in this uh, list of games has piqued your interest, thought about streamlining something, let us know. Level up your gaming podcast at gmail.com or facebook.com slash level up your gaming. Also, the podcast is on YouTube, so go ahead and smash the like button over there. Otherwise, subscribe to the podcast, your favorite podcast. I recommend it to a friend, write a review, all those good things. And that's going to wrap us up for the week. So for Josh. I'm Aaron. Have a good week, everyone. Bye.